so happy that we're all together in person here. Uh, what a year, right? <laughs> so, I'm really thankful to be here. Uh, amazing organization, doing amazing work, LINK. Uh, really helping our youth get to that next level and hopefully a new generation of those who really have the tools to have emotional mastery. <clears throat> so, it's been a journey, um, myself, many years really researching, digging, looking, learning, and Baruch Hashem, Hashem led me to a lot of uh, leading masters of uh, you know, what we can do to really maximize the power of our brain so that we can override our emotions. Let me explain. The way the brain is set up, the way God created our brain, is that the limbic part of our brain, which is the emotional part of our brain, organically works three to four times faster than our rational mind. So it's very easy for us to right away feel an intense emotion when something happens to us. And then, of course, because of that intense emotion, we can react in a very strong, negative way. So, thank God research to show us that we can upgrade the speed of our rational mind so that it could go three to four times faster than our emotional part, so that basically we can think through the situation and not so quickly react emotionally and then have that self-mastery over our heart. Ultimately though, our goal is to capture the power of that heart of ours that can feel more positive emotions and override the natural tendency of the brain um, to just like listen to the heart and just feel the negative emotions. A very important concept uh, to understand how this process begins is that your thoughts actually is what creates the emotion. Then the emotion creates the reaction. So if you're looking at a situation and your mind is thinking negatively about it, because that's where your mind is going, then your heart will create this emotion following the initial thought. And it's very easy for the emotion to escalate, percolate, and grow in its intensity as you continuously think in those negative ways. So a quick, like, a chill pill of how to get out of that negative emotional state is by nipping in the bud the negative thought. So a thought could be, how dare they? I can't believe that. I, I, after everything I did for them. And you quickly change your thought to, oh, probably they're maybe tired. Oh, they're just uh, probably haven't uh, maybe eaten right today. And so the actual positive thought, looking at the circumstance in a very positive way, will help that emotion dissipate and eventually decrease in its power over you and hopefully be eliminated. So if you look at this picture of this brain, my colleague, Dr. Carol Lerman, once gave me this when we were doing neuroscience classes together. And if you see here in the part of the brain, which is the prefrontal uh, cortex, that's the part of the brain that has to do with cognition and reasoning. Now remember, that part of the brain typically is three to four times slower than the part of the brain which is here in the section 
right across from it, the amygdala, which has to do with mood and emotion and memory. So if your way of thinking is constantly negative, uh, then the emotion will flare up. If you work on your cognitive part of your brain to think more positively and to activate more positive reasoning in dealing with any situation, then as your cognitive part of your brain increases, the amygdala part of your brain, the emotional part of your brain decreases. So if one goes up, the other goes down. So the more we do these kinds of brain training techniques of increasing our positive thought processes, the greater we'll have that self-mastery over our emotions. So generally speaking, there's traumas, there's things that happened to us in our childhood, and there's even past memories even uh, in the DNA of our soul of like past lives or things that happened to our parents while we were in our mother's stomach. These things can actually get ingrained in our brain. But fortunately, again, because our brain has what's called neuroplasticity, it has the power to stretch itself in a way and, 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 and prune out what is not working for us. Kind of like in a garden, there's weeds in the garden. You're not stuck with weeds. Well, if you just sit there and let them grow, yeah, they'll take over. The brain is like a garden. And if you plant more and more positive seeds of positive thinking, so that you could say to yourself, whatever my childhood was, was from Hashem, it was meant to be, it was for my good, it was for me to create certain spiritual and um, coping uh, qualities about my neshama. Because of my experience, now I'm wiser for it, I'm more compassionate. Whatever positive seeds of uh, logic and reasoning that you plant in your mind, then the brain will prune out the negative. It happens organically with time. Kind of like if you ever seen, I lived in New York and it's, you know, snow up to here. And if one person went through and then another person went through, then the pathway becomes like bigger and bigger and easier to pass through. So our brain creates these pathways. They're called neuro pathways. And when we create more positive thinking, our brain is making these uh, connections and creating um, no space, in a sense, for the old negative way of thinking. It becomes more obsolete. It becomes stored like farther away and not so much, you know, right in the front of your brain. And eventually, once you really do this work, hopefully, you know, I've been doing it for like 30, I don't know, four years since I got my master's degree. Uh, and every time um, I see a greater and greater improvement in my brain capacity for self-mastery. Now in this generation, it's a bit tough because there is so much, oh yeah, there's so much um, bombardment of our brain, you know, Facebook, Instagram, texting, WhatsApping, emails, it's all coming to us. And it has its effect of uh, like our, affecting our mind and making it a bit unsettled and too chaotic. So we have to, in this generation, work even extra harder than those during, you know, just the TV time, uh, where it was, you know, not on the subway with you and not, you know, in the bathroom with you. So that, um, that the brain doesn't get so overstimulated and not able to then really focus and do this kind of brain training. Let me explain. The brain is like a muscle. 
When we don't use it, it could get atrophy. A person sits in a couch eating potato chips all day long and doesn't use their body, then they won't even be able to walk after a while because the muscles will atrophy. So the same thing, our brain is like a muscle and if we don't proactively use it in a specific brain training way, then what happens is it becomes mushy, like the mushy muscles that have atrophy. So recent research by Harvard University, by Dr. Sara Lazar, actually took pictures of the brains of people who did this type of brain training versus people that just lived their life watching TV and really weren't proactive in any kind of brain training. And so what did they find? In these pictures, in the images of these pictures, 30 years she tracked them, she took pictures of them every year, she interviewed them, what did she find? In the pictures of those that did the brain training, whether it was learning new language, learning new um, musical instruments, learning uh, any type of higher knowledge, their cortex lining of their brain thickened. So what does it say? It actually physically became thicker, the brain. Not only that, she saw that there were more neurotransmitters between the brain and the heart. Remember, we're trying to make a brain-heart connection. The more we make these neural pathways, the more strong the brain is to be able to reach the heart and say, shh, don't get anxious, shh, calm down. It's not worth getting overactive about this. It's just a mistake. It's not about you personally. So the more your mind has this brain strength, it has the power to then override. And this was what was in the pictures of these brain scans, that there was like more, you know, highway, uh, like highways, uh, you know, from the brain to the heart. She also found that there was less empty space in the grooves of the brain. So like the more muscle, the more space it takes, right? So. Then she also interviewed them and she found this. Not only did they not suffer anxieties and depressions and all kinds of emotional disturbances, but also less mental disturbances, less, you know, issues with uh, severe, you know, mental issues like bipolar and, and schizophrenia and OCD and things like that. She also found that this long-term working of the brain ended up helping the elderly diminish its percentage of Alzheimer, Parkinson's, and all kinds of aging of the mind problems like dementia. So she found that this brain training actually also prevented future brain illnesses. Again, mushy mind, mind doesn't work. Strong mind, mind works today and even better tomorrow and even better in a year and even better at age 60 and 65 when some of these ailments start happening because the brain's just not strong enough and healthy enough to deal with the reality of a weakened mind. So we see that even in our Torah, we are taught so much of this that science is now catching up with it. Um, one of the teachings of the Rebbe, when it talks about when Yosef was actually in a pit, do you remember that? And there was scorpion and snakes and there was no water. So like what? <laughs> Like, it's like the Torah. I mean, like, what are you talking about? Who cares? Like, you know, really. I mean, there's so much like life philosophy to like, what is this about? But the Lubavitcher Rebbe teaches us that this story has deep 
mystical interpretations to help us understand the power of our mind. And the example the Rebbe gives is that the brain is like a pit. If you don't supply it with the water of Torah, with the wisdom, meaning to have more and more cognitive ways of developing positive, you know, thinking processes, which Torah does help us. Everything's for the good. Hashem is always with you. There's a reason why this is happening. All this is positive cognitive thinking. So the more your mind is filled up with water, then scorpion and snake-like negative thoughts won't as easily come to plague you. Remember, your mind is a garden. If you plant the seeds of positivity, then you'll have positive thoughts. And those positive thoughts will create positive emotions. But if you allow your brain to not fill up with the water and the wisdom of these positive teachings, then the negative, biting-like negative thoughts, like scorpion and snakes that come to attack you and plague your mind. So much so that it's like you're nonstop thinking so negative that that's where the anxieties and the depressions and all negative emotion comes from. So we're taught in science that we have what's called the faculty of imagination. And so does our Torah teaches that. And the more we activate our faculty of imagination in a good way, the more we have this ability not to let our brain run wild indiscriminately with these scorpion and snake-like negative thoughts. So the teaching in the Torah is that don't go after your heart's desire, right? We say it every day in the Shema, lo taturu, don't go after what your eye sees and what your heart wants. Well, most people when they read that in the Shema, they think, Oh yeah, my heart's desire is I love cakes and cookies and I want to eat all day long and it's dangerous for me or I want to smoke or I want to do whatever and that's my heart's desire and I know I'm not supposed to go after it. I'm not supposed to have an indulgent life because it's not good for me spiritually. But most people don't realize that the heart is also the emotion. So don't go after your heart's desire. Your heart is telling you by default, be angry, be annoyed, be anxious, be depressed. But your thoughts in the Torah, don't go after your heart. Do some brain training. Do some more learning Torah. Fill your mind with positivity. So you'll have the power to override your heart's desires of anxiousness and depression. And that's why when you learn about the seven fat cows, Right? And the seven skinny cows. Remember that, that whole dream that Pharaoh had? That was also a deep mystical explanation of the power of our mind. The seven skinny cows represent a, a weak mind. A skinny cow. It doesn't have power. And the fat cows represents all the good in your life. And your mind can swallow up all the reality of what's good in your life, swallow it up, and you stay with the skinny, weak thinking. I'm not good enough. I, I don't. Life is not worth uh, all the struggle. I'm, I'm, I'm so incapable. And all this like wild imagination that's not really based on reality. The mind tricks you into believing that. It will like snatch you, as it were, into the state of negative emotion. Now, why do some people have anxious thoughts more than another person? Another person might have more depressed thoughts. Another person might be more prone to anger because they, they have these angry thoughts. So, first of all, each of us have all of these four basic animalistic emotional negative tendencies 
And this has to do with the four elements. I actually wrote a children's book and I actually also have a CD on it. It's on, free on YouTube, you can get it. Um, where it goes through the four elements to teach children these basic emotional traits that are innate in our being, the way God created us. But these negative uh, uh, traits actually, when channeled and directed and known how to be used in a good and a holy and a productive way, when the brain knows how to channel these negative emotions to positive, then the person's biggest weakness is their greatest strength. So as a counselor, someone will call me and say, my husband, he's so angry, he's so angry. I go, oh my goodness, he is so holy. He has so much fire. So fire, we all have fire, water, air, and earth, basic elements in us. The fire in us causes us to be anxious and angry. And some people are born with more fire. Just like Yitzhak Avinu, he was born with more fire. His personality was gvura. His personality was his ability to have awe and wonderment of Hashem. Whereas his father was born with a water element. And the water element has to do with pleasure. The pleasure in a not good way is pleasure and addictions, food, shopping, uh, drugs, alcohol, money, honor, chasing after this pleasure. In a holy way, this water element is the pleasure in helping people, the pleasure in kindness, the pleasure of loving people, the pleasure of loving God. So Abraham was gifted with a lot of water. So he was a trailblazer in doing kindness. And Yitzchak was gifted with a lot of yira. He, he also loved Hashem, but his take, his gem, his gift is that he got extra fire. Now, a person who has extra fire, then either will be the extra angry type of person or the extra anxious person. But once they realize they're like Yitzchak Avinu and they could channel it toward awe and wonderment and blown away and beyond grateful for everything Hashem does and wow, they could be on a high instead of the anger and the anxiousness. So people who come to me with anxiety problems, I say, you gotta upgrade your brain's use of fire in a good and holy way. Try every time to think of the great divine providence in the moment of your day-to-day -day existence. You found a parking spot. Oh my gosh. Okay, in LA it's not so hard. In New York, oh my, you'd have to search three, almost 30 minutes until you get a parking space at midnight and then go home. So like the small things, the more you use on wonderment in the divine providence, of your day and think of Hashem and think of goodness that just happened to you. I left three minutes later and because of that I, I met a friend in the market and I hadn't seen her in 20 years. Like what a miracle. Thank you Hashem for making me late and then we just crossed the road at the right time. Oh my gosh. So the more you use on wonderment, the less you have anxiety and even anger. The same with the water element. The water element, as I said, people who have addictions, they don't have to go to a 12-step program, really. They, they can use their addictive personality to get addicted to prayer, to learn, to do kindness, to have pleasure in giving, have pleasure in tzedakah, have pleasure in helping people. And they can upgrade their love of God in prayer. They could upgrade their love of God through learning. Just like the person who has a lot of fire could use their fire in prayer to think of the wonders of Hashem. And all the words and prayers just really intensify one's awe of Hashem, how He takes care of the birds, He takes care of the sickly, He makes our back straight, He gives our eyes. And just all is there to bring in our mind 
an appreciation of how God is so great and takes care of us. Again, this is all the positive seeds that you're planting in your mind. But if you're praying, blah, 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 you don't even know what you're saying, blah, 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 blah. You're not planting those positive seeds. You're not paying attention to the word. You're not paying attention to the positive outlook of life and of gratefulness and appreciation. And then you'll see the diminishment of anger and anxiety or the addiction. So someone who has an earthy element, remember there's four, we covered two. Who was earthy? I think who was uh, the first uh, king before David and Melech, there was uh, Shaul. Shaul, he was very depressed. His nature was that he got depressed and he needed David and Melech to sing the beautiful music to revive him. So there are people who are born with more earthy element and they tend and lean toward laziness, depression, and even the severe cases of suicide. They just can't breathe life. They're just so like can't cope. So again, a person gifted with a lot of earth, if not tapped into, will become the more depressed type of personality. A person that knows how to tap into this earthy temperament in a good way, which means when you think about earth, it's heavy. Life is heavy. Oh my gosh, it's like you're carrying like mounds of earth on you. Like the world is too heavy. When you think about earth and it like slows you down, right? It's like heavy. But earth, if you mound and you know like and cultivate that, that earth, it's a garden. It, it makes for a beautiful uh, orchard, a beautiful, you know, you know, trees full of all organic fruits and vegetables, there, right? So earth, when used in a productive way, um, when a person meditates and thinks deeply and contemplates and visualizes and imagines all the good and thinks positivity, this is the earth element. Because if your brain is all over the place you, and you're not like settled and you're not grounded, then you can't use the power of your mind. So earthy element type of personalities, the person is gifted with extra creativity, extra brain power, extra imagination. They're the creative ones more usually. They've been gifted with this extra earth element. Again, if they don't use it in a good way, if they rush through their davening and they don't use their earth element in a positive way, blah, 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 blah. they're not meditating, thinking, what do these words mean to me? Why am I saying these words? then they aren't using their earth element. If they're learning Torah and it's just, I'm saying the Hayom Yom or the Tanya of the day, or I don't know, Hafez Chaim of the day, and you're just like barely, ba barely paying attention to what you're reading. You're not using the earth element. So then the earth element is taken by the other side, the Yetzirah, because nobody's using it in a good way. And then it becomes depression. So the fourth element is the either destructive air element of speech, which I liken it to diarrhea of the mouth, where the person doesn't have any power over their speech. They're constantly boasting, constantly arguing, they're constantly fighting. They just can't, they just always feel the need to, to criticize and, and, and say negative things. You might know some type of those people. Sometimes it's your own parents. Sometimes that's what you grew up with. So the air element in them, they were gifted. They're the type of people that could maybe be singers. They're gifted with oratory skills. They could, once they tap into it and develop this in a positive and good way, they could sing the davening and use the power of speech to connect to Hashem. You know, like Hashem created you with, your, with, with His breath. And so we're creating a connection back to Hashem with our breath in prayer. 
So the more we use our breath in a positive and a holy way, then we'll diminish the tendency, if we're that type of person that has diarrhea of the mouth, we'll have more control over our speech. So these four elements, when our brain starts using them in a good and a productive way, then it, it's not a free-for-all. Our faculty of imagination won't then use these in a destructive way. And it's very fascinating, in the book by Dr. Melrose, called The 60 Second Fix, states that your brain has the power within 60 seconds if you do this every day for 60 seconds in like 40 days, your brain can start changing its outlook and actually be able to implement a new goal, a new behavior. So for instance, it happened to me, I put my keys at a certain place and at one point I realized it was disturbing people where it was when they were sleeping, so I moved it. Well, guess what? My brain was so used to, oh, I need my keys, it went to the original spot. It took almost a month of me going back to the original spot, I'm like, oh, it's not here, I put it here. Oh my gosh, how can I forget? I'd be so embarrassed, I'd keep like, you know, doing the same, like, because your brain has a habit. And you can break that habit, as we said, by making the new neural pathways, by creating the new path. And <clears throat> one of the ways is visualizing the new behavior. So you can visualize yourself using the fire of odd wonderment instead of seeing a vision. Of course, you don't want to see a vision of yourself being angry, right? So. Let me explain the power of imagery. Science teaches us that our brain does not know the difference between past, present, and future. Do you know what that means? You can outwit your brain and become something that you're not, as it were. Because you really actually are. That's really who you truly are. That's your essence of goodness that you truly are once you use these elements in a good way. It's really not you, the angry you. That's not really who you are. So really, you're practicing in a way and outwitting your brain to get back to the true you because you'll use this in a good and positive way. So in this uh, teaching, actually the Rebbe Rishab also says, one minute of a meditation can really change your whole day. Like just by practicing in the moments of, let's say when you wake up in the morning and you, you say modani, and then you visualize yourself happy and oh my gosh, so thankful. Like and really think of what you have to be thankful for. By the way, research shows that they did a research, they had a band and they had the word gratitude on it. And they ask one group of people to think of something to be grateful about while they're switching the band from the one hand to the next hand. And another group, they said, just switch the band. And they actually tested their hormonal levels of cortisol. And those who did the modani meditation, they just said gratitude meditation, their cortisol level, their stress hormone went way down. Their happy chemicals were elevated, and then they interviewed them, and they were way happier that month than the group that just did the band thing without the gratitude thing. So we see that Hashem tells us, start your day with a foundation of positive thoughts. Start planting seeds in your brain and actually visualize it to outwit your brain. Maybe you have nothing really to be happy about. Maybe this person is sick, and maybe you have no job, and, and in reality, how could you be happy? But you focus your mind on what is there to be happy, that your eyes are working, that you have hearing, that, that you do have you know, a roof over your head, and, that, yeah, and you focus on the positive thoughts. Again, 
cortisol level down, happy chemicals up, even though there's maybe not that much really that you could think about. But you focus and you force yourself to find the positive. And you fake it till you make it in a visualization that you're so happy. And research shows even if you smile and you're not really happy, your happy chemicals go up. There's something about these physical things that we do with our brain, with our body. Dance, get the endorphins going, and the rest will follow. So there's a sentence that says, your mind is a garden, your thoughts are the seeds. You can grow flowers or you can grow weeds. So a lot of times people have the anxiety or the depression and guess what happens because of that they have a secondary effect they have what's called anxiety that they have anxiety or they're or they're depressed that they're depressed and it's like a snowball effect and it can go worse and worse and deeper and deeper into a situation where they can't get out of it as so there's a concept that is called cognitive dissonance, which is, I'll quote, the mental conflict that arises from being in a state of doubt. And it can be so painful to the person, they'll do almost anything to escape it. Let me get my mind off of this. Let me get my, and they'll just like look at things and they'll just, I don't know, even read, uh, even though they hate cooking, they'll even look at the recipes and, and how to make food and they don't even want to make food and they hate cooking. Just to get away from the internal pain of the emotion of maybe what's going on in their life. And sometimes based not on reality. Like again, the skinny cows over exaggerate the faculty of imagination makes a huge like mess of things when it's really not based on reality. So there's a technique that's called pairing. So that you pair your brain in an image. So for instance, you can see yourself near a waterfall. Maybe you were in some trip at high school that was the best time of your life. And you, you, you pair your brain to the image of what was, again, and your brain doesn't know that it was yesterday or 10 years ago. Now you're having this image, you're pairing your mind to a past event, or you can pair it to like a futuristic imagery. Let's say, you know, you're not married and you just see yourself at your wedding and you're, you're all beautiful and you're just gorgeous. And it's something even in the future and you pair your mind. So the brain doesn't know between past, present, future, and it'll feel like you're experiencing that high, that happy mood that you had back then, or the happy mood you will have in the future by doing it now. And this is a technique that even works in a negative way. So for instance, if someone wants to quit smoking or they, they're a sugarholic and you know, the, the doctors are saying you'll have diabetes if you don't like really take control of this water element of your pleasure-seeking personality, so you can put an imagery and pair the cookies, let's say with snakes and worms and ugh, smoke and fire. So your brain will pair the image with this destructive way of eating so that you will like almost get repulsed when then you see the cookie. So that you can train your brain how to get out of this habit that's destructive. So there's many, many uh, different doctors also that um, talk about somatic experiences, meaning a person will feel like in their heart, like the pain when they're anxious. Or they'll feel their stomach churning and squished and like almost someone like giving them a, 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 you know, a box in their stomach. It'll be physical. But through certain brain training techniques, you can even undo the physical symptoms by 
brain training. For instance, one idea. Um, actually, it was from the book uh, Alkali or Die because it was talking about how when, <clears throat> let's say you have an emotional upset. Someone really just hurt your feelings. So you can physically feel the pain in your body because of it, unfortunately, or even the emotional pain is right there. And this actually creates acid in your body. And so much so that let's say you're mildly offended. It's like as if you put one eighth cup of sugar in your mouth and it like, uh, you know, sugar actually goes through the blood barrier the blood brain barrier and just goes shoop, to your brain and causes like this this reaction this mental negative reaction from the sugar especially people who are glucose intolerant so a person who is moderately emotionally affected by a situation it's like they have two-thirds cup of sugar the brain just starts to make acid and if someone is really affected negatively then the brain is like on a, on a sugar explosive of like a one and a half cups of sugar. The brain just is on over, overdrive, like on steroids, like completely like not in like groundedness and functioning. That's what happens when you're an emotionally upset. So a technique that you could use is imagine a coin. And imagine the coin like a quarter or even a 50 you know, cent coin and it's big. And you imagine in your mind that this represents your pain. And then you see in your mind's eye that the coin is getting smaller, like quarter. And then you see in your mind's eye that it's getting smaller, like a nickel. And then smaller, like a dime. And then you visualize no more coin. It's gone. Ah. And now you feel your bodily sensation has changed because you put your mind off of it. Before your thoughts were on, oh, how could they do that? I can't believe I went through this. And the emotion is growing and growing and it causes even physical sensation of discomfort in your body. Now you're putting your mind off of it and you're visualizing something different and helping you focus on diminishing the pain. Now, of course, the more you put God into the imagery and more positive thoughts, oh, the pain is really the Yetzirah and the pain is not really my soul powers know that whatever happened is for the good. So the more you put, of course, more godly intention in whatever meditation that you do, of course, the more power to you to really diminish that Yetzirah's power over you. Yeah. So what if what if um, what if I don't know why why I'm anxious? Like I don't know why. Oh, okay. So <laughs> again, so the more you'll develop on wonderment in your prayers, in your learning, in thinking about the divine providence, how awesome it is that this happened to you and that happened to you, and that you see the Hashgacha practice in life, then the more you channel that anxiety to fear of God, not fear like oh, fear of God, but like ah, oh, wonderment. Then the um, because sometimes when something happens to you and you don't know why, it's subconscious. Again, we talked about how there's things in the subconscious that can relate to maybe something that happened when you were just an infant. Let's say I don't know, there was a squirrel that came up to you and ah! and so. Every time you see any kind of thing that moves like a squirrel, you all of a sudden get anxious and you don't even know what it's for. Because it may be that the squirrel really scared you and traumatized you when you were just like six months old as a baby. And you have no clue. It's subconscious. But again, the more and more we plant seeds and fill our mind with positivity, then these old things have no room to exist in your brain. It, it will not have space to reside in you, just like a computer. There's only so many files a computer can have. Oh my gosh, our phone, right? Overload, <laughs> iCloud can't save you anymore. <laughs> like, even you pay $100 more a month, there's just your over the top film. 
So when you're over the top filled in your brain with positivity, just like no room for the other stuff. So there's um, work like that we can see, for instance, with Dr. Sarno, where he says that emotional traumas can then manifest itself in physical problems. So for instance, someone will have a backache. Someone will have headaches. I can't get rid of these headaches. Some people have constant chest pains. So the explanation that he gives why that most ailments are 99.9999999.9% because of emotional challenge that you might not even be aware of. And so the physical body manifests itself in a physical way because the brain doesn't want to deal with anything more. I'm done, I'm too stressed out, you know what I'm, I'm gonna give you a headache and you'll think about the headache instead of the real problem. I'll give you a backache, so now you'll be, oh my back, oh my back. But the real problem is, is maybe you haven't had a shidduch yet and you're constantly worried about it, but your brain can't handle it anymore, so it gives you a whack on your back. Oh, so now I'll think about my backache instead of my shidduch. Yes, the brain does that. So Dr. Sharno actually says you can unmask the game and say the backache is just a manifestation of something deeper going on that I'm not coping with, that's a stress in my life, that I, you know, there was a rabbi, Rabbi Majeski, and he had, and he talked about this publicly and it was very well known in Crown Heights, he went from anything and everything to get rid of this back problem. And someone suggested Dr. Sarno's book. And he did the work. And finally, years of going everywhere, almost surgery, it went away. When he did this work of unmasking the real stressor that he had that was causing the body to manifest in a physical ailment so that his mind won't have to deal with the real problem. Can I ask you something? Yeah. So I'm going into the field of Chinese medicine, and so it's very much similar in this way where we say pain is is emotion. Yes. It's energy and emotion that's building up and stuck and it's not flowing. Properly. Exactly. So. so like when a person is stressed out, their systems are more constricted. Their blood isn't flowing as properly. People have no water in their brain because the constriction of whatever they're going through and the trauma and the negative thinking and the negative emotion, it's all closed and that's how people get also overweight because there's no flow. The body fluids don't allow for the fluids to help the body get rid of the toxins and get rid of the fat, which the Rebbe used to say, uh, to people who are overweight, have you tried simcha to lose weight? Because a constricted, fearful, negative emotion person is uptight and it's holding on. There's no movement, so it stays. But when you're happy and you're dancing and you're open and you're, you know, then things flow. So, so when we have positivity, it also affects our physical health because it allows things to be open and expansive and flow. So one case of this person who was having ear problems, and I use this a lot in my practice with people who have physical problems. I say to them, hmm, because sometimes the body part is related to the emotional distress that they're not dealing with. That's according to Dr. Sarno. So I ask them like, it's interesting, it's your ears. Like, is there something you've been hearing that's like making you anxious? Something, you know, you imagine during COVID, how many people were hearing, you know, all the negative reports. It, it does something to you. So I said like, you know, it happened to be not during the COVID time, but I asked them, like, she says, well, I've been hearing about this yeshiva and I've been hearing about that yeshiva and I'm so stressed out. Should I go here? Should I go there? I'm so stressed out, I'm hearing. I don't want to hear anymore of any suggestions. It's too confusing. Uh huh. Your ear that doesn't want to hear has been causing you now ear aches. 
so that you can stop thinking about the problem, really. And now you're running around to doctors and nothing was helping. No antibiotics, no this, they couldn't find anything. In one session, after like almost a year of his ear not working and ringing and hurting, gone. Because we unmasked the brain's technique of causing a physical problem to divert the mind from the real problem. Because the real problem was too anxious provoking. But again, positive thoughts and training the mind to say, oh, thank God, there's so many options. And working through not being anxious on the different options and knowing that whatever you choose is where God places you and it's going to be good for you would have prevented, of course, the anxiousness. So the more this person would have worked on awe and wonderment of God's divine providence that I don't have to worry if I go here it's where I'm meant to be it's who I'm going to meet maybe I'm going to meet my shidduch in this school and that's the only reason Hashem put me in that school because I'll meet this rabbi and this rabbi will have a daughter for me who knows so this kind of positive outlook would have prevented of course such a physical issue that this person would have had so that's the power of our brain, and I'm glad you came to the first course. Uh, I think it was a good beginning, and i um, looking forward to the next few sessions. Um, if you have any questions, I hope it was mind-blowing. No. <laughs> uh, and we planted a lot of good seeds, I hope. Oh, and thank you. Uh, um, those of you who are on Facebook, thank you for joining. And then Zoom, maybe there are questions on the chat for the Zoom. Anyone? Or on Facebook? I have questions. Yeah? So you mentioned this, the, the quarter, the silver dollar, and initially dealing it, if you're hurt, shrinking it down. Right. And that's for that moment, but like whatever occurred still occurred. So then how do you apply that when you're at, when you're, you can't make it totally go away. I mean, you have to... You can. I mean, I, I, actually, I actually used it again and again in different scenarios. But you can train your brain before an incident happens, for instance. You can see an incident that a person is like, blah, 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 not so nice. And you're like floating. You're just like, like protected by a... You could have a vision of a protection of like this... This cloud, misty, like cuddly cloud of protection that their energy can't enter your sacred zone of joy and happiness in life. And you could practice and practice in your mind different kinds of visualization that suit you, that you like. One of the visualizations I did, a castle around your heart. I actually wrote a children's book about it. You could see it on Amazon. And it, this girl goes through this experience of like being bullied. And so the teacher shows her how to build a castle around her heart. Just like a princess is in a castle and the princess is protected by the big castle and by the guards. And so that she could train herself to say, I'm here, I'm safe. Their arrows can enter my heart and they will not penetrate me because my guards, my way of thinking, my understanding, my compassion on their weakness of, of maybe they have a horrible childhood or maybe they, they don't have friends and they're just, maybe they're a fire element, you know, and, and they were born with a fiery temperament and they're an angry type of personality. Their arrows can't can get to me. So whatever imagery works for you, to practice these types of positive thoughts, well then in the end, you're gonna pair your brain like that, and when it happens, you're like, oh, I'm in a castle, I'm protected, I feel sorry for you. Another technique I do is celebrate you. You know, practice that when people are mean to you, instead of letting their arrows penetrate you and hurt you, celebrate! And say like, thank God I'm not like them! Like, thank you Hashem, you gave me a more compassionate understanding hard you made me like so much nicer you know the creation of the world just like there's rot wilder types of dogs and there are like uh, dogs that are you know cuddly and just mm -hmm. like you know labrador they're so good with people they're just so kind 
monkeys they they adopt orphan monkeys like so maybe they were created like a rat wilder and it's harder for them it's their nature and they have to battle it way harder than you so celebrate you that you weren't created with such difficulties or maybe they had a rotten childhood and you had a better childhood whatever the reason celebrate you so there's like different techniques um you can go on my website yournewheights.com i have a youtube channel as well and there's so many meditations on there and so many brain training classes i welcome you to uh, continue learning on this journey if you, you have any questions from the zoom so no yeah. okay i want to say thank you thoroughly enjoyed it oh i'm so happy Thanks. all right yeah, i highly recommend the meditation yeah Oh, good. I'm so happy. Yeah, I have like a Shabbos meditation. And there's this also a mind movie that I made with a friend of mine where it's like practicing in images. So it's an imagery meditation, but you actually see it on the computer. I'll forward it to you and you can sure. forward it to the group. Um, and it's inner child work of like training yourself to be your own best friend mm -hmm. and not needing other people to make you feel good about yourself basically. Very important. Yes. Yes. I was actually going to ask you, do you have like a meditation on like this sort of concept? Oh yeah. Um, I actually have a CD that I'll show you, but it's actually online for free. Um, as you go on YouTube and it has a element, four elements meditation. And also on my brain train channel for children, I went through all four elements in detail as well with a meditation on each, the fire separate. And each one is like, like 15, 20 minutes, just on fire, just on air and earth. It's also online. Yeah. I, I didn't see that. Yeah. On yournewheights.com, it's there. Yeah. yeah on the, I didn't see the meditation. Oh, I'll show you it. It's actually someone, I have it here. I'll show you, I'll forward it to you today. All right, so I'll see you hopefully next week. I'm so happy. Yes. Bye bye. Thank you for joining. Thank you.